Well, uh, the Velikovsky debate had a couple of phases, and we were very much involved in uh, the staging of this history of the Velikovsky debate, because initially it was just Velikovsky came out with an extraordinary idea, and it was very popular, except that the scientific establishment completely rejected the hypothesis. There was not one thing said by Velikovsky and his worlds in collision that uh, was acceptable to mainstream science. Not, not one thing. Now, Velikovsky suggested that the uh, Hebrew account of the Exodus and the Sea of Passage, the dividing of the, the Red Sea and so on, was actually a, a, an account of the near passage of Venus. The, the, uh, the sun standing still, Joshua raising his hands, and the sun standing still in a subsequent episode of that story in Velikovsky's Reconstruction were all part of this celestial drama. I, I've never been convinced by that, but I accept that it is a fundamental contribution of Velikovsky to a really serious study. There have been separate lines of investigation by people it, uh, working with things that started with an inspiration from Velikovsky. I, I progressively moved away from certain historical dimensions of Velikovsky's reconstruction having to do with the history of the Israelites uh, having to do with his account of the planet Venus, having to do with his account of the planet Mars in catastrophe from the second millennium down to the first millennium BC. Now, so what happened then is that within the Velikovsky movement, there was a pro progressive specialization of research and a, a kind of uh, competition of ideas coming out of that. And I found myself settling so fully on the story of how it all began from that launching point of an investigation, I moved by degrees to a wholesale revisioning of the entire story of world mythology. And that then did not give room for accepting these first millennium BC, uh, second millennium BC, first millennium BC accounts of the comet Venus and the planet Mars and all of that. Now this is also preposterous. Okay, what I'm, su I'm suggesting is that if you start with an image of this planetary configuration, which we use as the, 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 the centerpiece of a reconstruction, what happens to the bodies that are depicted there, plus one other body hidden behind this large sphere of Saturn, will, what happens will not leave room for any other archetype. In other words, every archetype of world mythology can be identified in the story of these bodies and, and what, what happened to them, leaving nothing out. So the, the challenge then becomes, because there are hundreds of mythic archetypes. Now how am I going to prove to somebody that every mythic archetype is no more than two or three degrees separated from any other mythic archetype? So I, I'll go through this exercise if people, you know, you want to take the time with me uh, just to pose the question and then consider what I might suggest in terms of relationship. I mean, what was, what was the planet Venus? It was the mother goddess. Okay, what was the mother goddess? It was the central eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun. So we don't have just the comet Venus there. We have the primeval sun and its identity as Saturn. But what is the telling archetype of the mother goddess in relationship to another, a third figure, the warrior hero? The mother goddess is the primeval womb from which the warrior hero was born and the conjunction of the warrior hero is the, uh, the, with that goddess figure. The warrior hero born as that innermost sphere 
in the center of that discharging star of Saturn. Its story is the full story of the warrior hero archetype. So this isn't an easy thing to establish for people, that there's this underlying integrity, there's a substructure of world mythology, there was a warrior hero, its story begins, uh, uh, he is the pupil of the eye, he is the innermost heart or, or, or soul of the mother goddess who is the discharging star in the center of Saturn. And that story, if you follow the threads, will seamlessly connect every archetype to every other archetype of world mythology. And the only thing I have not mentioned is that behind that luminous primeval sun identified as Saturn, there was another body that was Jupiter. Now, they're not going to just hang up in the sky like that except for uh, an arrangement that has never even been considered. It is a polar axial alignment of celestial bodies in what I called the great conjunction of primeval times. Well, it's not even conceivable that humanity would have experienced that without having presented to us numerous, almost countless instances of mythic themes that make no sense but are suggestive of a primeval conjunction of planets. Well, there's actually a, a mythic phrase for it, the great conjunction of primeval times. So, I mean, this is the Krita Yuga of the Hindu systems. The celestial powers all stood in a perfect line. And the Babylonian astronomer priest talks about the planets. In the beginning, they were in a perfect line, so perfect that that line would run right through the hearts of those gathered bodies. Now, this is just all off the map of common theory, common thinking about the past. But how does it happen that when you establish a frame of reference, nothing is left out? It's all specific, and there's not a spe single specific instance that answers to anything in human experience today. I always challenge people, find something in the, the world of archetypal symbolism, mythic history, find something that would logically cause one to see something in our sky today as the explanation for that. There is nothing in our experience today that accounts for a single mythic archetype. A terrestrial cataclysm uh, would be a certainty if these events occurred. These weren't remote bodies. These were bodies hovering immense in our sky in electrical or electrified plasma environments. They're all part of this uh, e electric primeval planetary interaction with phases of stability and phases of earth-shaking catastrophe. So this wasn't just a story about this stable planetary alignment. It's just that if you go back to the beginning, you always, you always come up to uh, the great conjunction of primeval times. In whatever words that would be expressed, I mean, for example, Egyptian symbolism never talks about a primeval conjunction of planets, and, they, and you know why that is? There were no planets back then. E Egyptian uh, systems, they start with that primeval system of gods in the sky, and so there's this primeval power, Atum or Ra, and he has a central eye. It's only a thousand years after the birth of the Egyptian systems that astronomers were uh, induced in, in ancient Mesopotamia to identify this goddess, the central eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun, as Venus. And so you look at Inanna, Ishtar, Inanna of the Sumerians, Ishtar of the Babylonians. What, what is the nature of these goddesses? They are the central heart and soul of the primeval sun.